This video is sponsored by Audible. Head over to audible.com slash nameexplain or text nameexplain to 500, 500 for a special deal only good till July 31st. More about that later. Every week here on Name Explain, we look at how places on our planet got their name. And while this channel is so often steeped in the etymology of our real world, today let's take a different approach. Many authors and creative people on our planet have enjoyed for centuries imagining alternate takes on our blue marble, sometimes for the better, but a lot of the time for the worst. These works of fiction that portray our home in a doomed state are known as dystopias, with the word dystopia itself having a pretty interesting origin too. The name dystopia only exists due to what came before it, its polar opposite, Utopia. A utopia is a fictional idea of a place where everything is perfect. Of course, to have a utopia in real life would be more or less impossible. There's no place that could really be a utopia. So that's why when this name was coined by Sir Thomas More in his 1516 work dubbed Utopia, he derived this name from the Greek Eutopos, meaning no place, and the Greek Eutopos, meaning good place, as there is truly no place like his vision of a good place. And it was from this idea of a utopia that the dystopias came from. As the word dystopia comes from the word utopia, but with the U replaced with the Greek dis prefix, meaning bad, difficult, abnormal, imperfect. And since this initial inception of dystopias, people around the world have been fascinated by them. Countless works of fiction from novels, films, video games, and television have given us a look into these visions of dystopian futures. And of course, in some of these stories, their world has become so far removed from our own that nations and settlements have been given new names. And of course, some dystopias are set in entirely fictional countries and places. So, how did these dystopian places get their names? One of the most popular dystopians in recent memory come in the form of Panem, the setting in the Hunger Games trilogy of books. In this world, a world-ending event took place, leading to the end of civilization as we know it and sea levels rising. We don't know what happened to the rest of the world, but with these sea level rises, North America shrank in size, and it was in North America that the nation of Panem came to be, with it being split into 13 districts in the capital. At some point in Panem's history, the districts launched a failed rebellion, and this led to the establishment of the Hunger Games, to remind the rebels each year that the capital controls them, and to give the masses a morbid form of entertainment to distract them from their lives. It's from this entertainment purpose of the Hunger Games that the name Panem derives from. The name Panem comes from the Latin phrase Panem et Circensis, which in English translates into bread and circuses. This phrase is used to describe the idea of giving the masses entertainment and food to keep them happy in trying times, where otherwise they'd be angry and rebel. With the Hunger Games being the bread and circuses, the capital feed to the districts of Panem. Personally, I feel this is a really cool name to give to this world, but it doesn't really make sense in the actual world of Panem. Why would they have named this land Panem when it was first formed? The Hunger Games themselves wouldn't have been a thing when this name for the nation was first being coined. Though, maybe that's just me thinking about things too much. The Hunger Games, however, isn't the only dystopian novel that forces young people to fight to the death. Before The Hunger Games, we had Battle Royale, a 1999 Japanese novel adapted to a film in 2000. This film and novel helped spawn the Battle Royale genre of fiction that is seeing a huge resurgence right now. The novel takes place in an alternate reality fascist Japan, where the nation emerged victorious after the Second World War. This Japanese government established a military program where 50 random students were kidnapped, dropped into an unknown location, and forced to kill one another until just one remains. This unknown location is the fictional island of Okinawa. Okashima, with it seeming that the real island of Ogejima being the key inspiration. In fact, the names of this real island and fictional island are exactly the same in Japanese, with only some minor changes. So to understand this fictional name, we are better off looking at the real name. The name literally translates to Man Tree Island, and is paired with the fellow island of Megajima, which means Woman Tree Island. Let's get away from the worlds of children trying to kill one another, shall we? Instead of a world where kids are being killed, why don't we look at one where the people are trying to bring more children to the world. Welcome to the Republic of Gilead, the totalitarian regime that has taken over much of the US in The Handmaid's Tale. In this world, reproduction rates have dropped to a dangerous low, and because of this, many women have had to become handmaids, whose purpose is to bear the children of high class couples who are unable to reproduce themselves. As well as the US getting a new name, the handmaids themselves get new names too when they become handmaids. The main character is known as Offred. She got this name because her commander, the man whose children she is forced to try and bear is named Fred, and all the handmaids are given names like this. While a little off topic for this video, I find it interesting how even the names of characters can cement a dystopian setting. Having a new name that not only replaces their original name, but places them as nothing more than just an extension or object to the higher power in their life. 
God, this is bringing back my English literature GCSE days. The name Gilead has deeply biblical roots. The name means mountain or hill country, and in Genesis, Jacob fled to a place called Gilead, and Jacob and his wife Rachel play a role in another verse from Genesis. This verse goes, and when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. She said unto Jacob, Give me child or else I die. And she said, Behold my maid, Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, so that I might also have children by her. And she gave him Bilhah, their handmaid, to wife, and Jacob went on to her. It's easy to see the similarities between this verse and Margaret Atwood's novel. It seems that the higher powers of Gilead took this very literally, and Jacob's tales and his fleeing to Gilead in the Bible helped form the name for what became of the United States of America. Dystopias, however, do not always have to be a nationwide affair. In fiction, we can have nations that are running smoothly, but have pockets of chaos in them. Perhaps the most noticeable dystopian city comes not from the pages of a novel, but rather the technicolor pages of the world of comics, that being Gotham, the Dark City of the Dark Knight. Gotham is a city that has been depicted in different ways across different media, yet the idea of the city being heavily polluted, rife with poverty and corruption, and of course run by a huge rogue gallery, seems to be a mainstay no matter what version of Gotham Batman is residing in. The Gotham City in Batman is heavily inspired by the very real New York City. One of NYC's many nicknames is apparently Gotham too. The story goes that Batman creator Bill Finger was inspired by an entry in a telephone book for Gotham Jewelers. He felt that calling the city Gotham as opposed to New York made the setting more vague, and so in issue 4 of Batman in 1940, the city was dubbed Gotham for the first time. On a more personal note, I think this name has really helped shape the image of Batman, especially due to the fact that the former part of the name literally has goth in it, as over time Batman changed from the silly, colourful character he was conceived as to become a much darker, broodier and, well, gothic character. The actual etymology of Gotham however is far less gothic, it simply comes from the Anglo Saxon Gotham, meaning Goat Town. So if you think Batman is the greatest of all time, you could call him the Goat of Goat Town. Another American dystopian city lies somewhere beyond the sea. This is of course the underwater city of Rapture from the Bioshock games. The creator of Rapture, Andrew Ryan, wanted to make a city free of the structure that was put upon the rest of the world, where the world's greatest minds were able to excel without government, social or religious restrictions. This was a government free place and that meant capitalism was key. Anyone could excel on their own merit while those who couldn't would suffer. Everything came with a price, from food to healthcare, even oxygen. Of course, this utopia Andrew Ryan dreamt of didn't go as planned, as by the time the player makes their way to the city, things are in a state of despair. The city has failed, and the people who are free to do as they wish have edited their own genes and mutated. This is far from the kind of rapture Andrew Ryan had in mind. In Christian terms, the rapture is an idea that in end times, only the devout Christians who follow the teachings of Jesus will be brought up to heaven and saved, or everyone else will be left on earth as the world comes to a close. Andrew Ryan hoped that this city would be his very own rapture, one where the people who deserve to live out their lives free of restraint could go and be saved, much like those who would be saved in the religious rapture. This word comes from the Latin raptus, meaning to be carried off or abducted. This is probably the only time I'm going to talk about Bioshock on the channel, so I don't think I'll have the opportunity to say this again. Would you kindly subscribe? The Matrix film series gives us a world in which humanity are forced to live in a simulated world, while the actual planet is overtaken by robots, using the human bodies as an energy source. Matrix is already a word that has a technological sounding ring to it, so it makes sense as to why it would be called this. However, Matrix is defined in the Cambridge Dictionary as the set of conditions that provides a system in which something grows and develops, and this perfectly encapsulates what the Matrix in the film series is, as it is indeed a system that allows humans to grow and develop within it. The actual the etymology of matrix comes from the way in which we all grow and develop, deriving from the old French matrice meaning womb slash uterus, which comes from the older Latin matrix meaning pregnant animal. I guess that's why the pods the humans are in in the matrix look like artificial wombs. One of the most renowned works of dystopian fiction is the novel Brave New World. Set hundreds of years in the future, human life has been industrialized. Babies are now born and conditioned in labs to be exactly how the higher ups want them to be. Brave New World takes a different approach however. Instead of using fear to control people, the masses are given access to 
unlimited pleasure in the form of sex and drugs. In this brave new world, it seems that countries no longer exist and everywhere is part of something called the world state. Being named so as this world state is a unification of the entire planet, all being run by a single government. I know it's not the most interesting name, but it didn't feel right talking about dystopias and not mentioning this one. However, the title of the most famous dystopian novel has to go to George Orwell's 1984, a book set in the far-flung future of 1984. Well, it was the future at the time, in a world with never-ending war and constant surveillance. Anyone not leading their life how the government wished them to faces consequences. The story is set in Great Britain, however by this time it has been renamed to Airstrip 1 and is part of the superstate Oceania. In fact, in the world of 1984, only three superstates exist, Oceania, Eurasia and East Asia. These names are pretty obvious, but why is Britain called Airstrip 1? It's thought that this name was apparently a jab at the US military, who during the Second World War filled Britain with many air bases. Orwell was rather anti-American and because of this, he toyed with the idea that in his dark vision of the future, Great Britain had just become one massive airstrip to the Americans, with My Dear Blighty becoming nothing more more than an extension and tool for America. Chances are if you enjoyed this video then you enjoy a good dystopian tale. If this is the case then please remember to go check out Audible who have very kindly sponsored today's video. Audible is a leading provider of premium digital spoken audio information and entertainment online and it's a service I use pretty much every day. In fact most of my videos are made while listening to an audiobook from Audible. I would like to say I'm the kind of person who can curl up with a book and read for hours but that simply isn't true. I have a tiny attention span and get distracted too easily to be able to read for long periods of time. Thanks to Audible, however, I can enjoy a huge variety of audiobooks and their free Audible originals while focusing on other things. I can listen to audiobooks while playing video games, going for walks, or making these videos. Thanks to Audible, I can enter the world of literature in a way I find way more accessible, engaging, and enjoyable than traditional reading. Every month, I get a new credit that I can use to purchase any audiobook Audible has to offer, and thanks to this, over the years I've been using Audible, I've amassed a great library from classic classic titles I love to new titles I discovered thanks to Audible. You can try Audible for free by going to audible.com slash nameexplain which will be linked down below or by texting my code nameexplain to 500 500. You'll get a 30 day free trial and a credit for any audiobook you choose. There's even a special deal for Amazon Prime members. They can save 66% on their first three months with Audible. It's like three months worth of Audible for the price of one month. This special deal for Prime members is only available in July so now is the best time to check out Audible. If you don't know what to get with your free audiobook credit, then why not use this video as a guide? Loads of the novels I mentioned in this video are available to listen to there. Dystopian novels like 1984, Brave New World, The Handmaid's Tale, and all the Hunger Games are there waiting for you to discover. Even dystopian novels I didn't cover like Fahrenheit 451 and The Man in the High Castle are available on Audible too. Right now, I'm listening to This Is Going To Hurt, Secret Diaries of a Junior Doctor. It's the journals of a former doctor working in the NHS, and it's something of a dystopian tale in its own right. So once again check out Audible for free by going to audible.com slash nameexplain which will be linked down below or by texting nameexplain to 500 500 and don't forget about that existing deal for Amazon Prime members to get 66% off their first three months. Once again thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video. Thank you to all my patrons who support Name Explain on a monthly basis. Name Explain depends on small monthly donations from fans like you to help keep the channel running. Just a small amount of $2 a month helps in a huge way, grants you patron exclusive Name Explain extras, and gets your name here with all these awesome people. Thank you.